For once, let's switch the concept of screensaver, shall we? In this episode, instead of discussing a particular movie or TV series, we focus on a biblical word and ask how it is portrayed in our culture. And the word chosen is angel. A fun way to discover how our culture pictures a word is the game Pictionary. You know, you draw a word so that your partner can guess it as quickly as possible. I'm quite sure that just about all of us would draw an angel the same way, namely like this. The wings make the angel. Most recently, we saw the angel's terrifying wings in Midnight Mass, but in our review of these series, we already told you that this is a perversion of biblical imagery. You can recognize a more mainstream angel in Michael, in the 1996 film of the same name, where John Travolta appears with impressive wings. The same Michael, by the way, is part of the group of archangels in DC Comics, where they are among the most powerful characters. This aside, back to the wings, because it's interesting to establish where they come from. You see, biblical angels don't have wings. True, you do find winged beings in biblical visions in the court of God, but they're called seraphim and cherubim, and they don't have two wings, but six. In Isaiah's calling vision, for example, you read the following. Seraphs were set up above him, each with six wings, two to cover the face, two to cover the feet, two to fly. But, you will say, these are angels, aren't they? And it's true, our culture has attached the function of these beings to the word angel. Incidentally, this has happened through a blending of the biblical imagination with the mythical from ancient culture. In Rome, go look at the impressive triumphal arches of the Roman Forum. There, in the corners above the arch, you will find winged creatures bearing the standard of the Roman army. These are images of Victoria, the god of victory. By the way, we know her even better by her Greek name, Nike, Nike. It's these images that make us draw wings for the Pictionary Assignment Angel. But as we pointed out, when you hear about an angel in the ancient biblical stories, there is no mention of wings. You see, several stories tell us that angels aren't recognized as such. They look like ordinary people, which is a little more difficult when you have massive wings hanging on your back. Now, what is the function of a biblical angel? The word itself says it all. The Greek angelos means messenger. It's a translation of the Hebrew malach. The angel is a postman, so to speak, or, or better yet, a herald who announces messages in the town square. I remember a heavyweight version of such a herald in the HBO series Rome. An actual crier who announces official messages to the public all the time in the Roman Forum. Of course, everything hinges on who a herald speaks for. That's why in the Old Testament you rarely find the word angel without the addition of the Lord, because that's the peculiarity of the biblical angel. He is a herald on behalf of God himself. So much so that in some texts, angel of the Lord and God are used interchangeably, and not in the least important texts. A, a crucial passage in the Old Testament is the conversation between Moses and God in the book of Exodus. God appears to Moses in the bush that is on fire but doesn't burn, it says. One time you read, God spoke to Moses. The other, the angel of the Lord said. They really do coincide. You find this principle, for example, in the unparalleled Bruce Almighty, where Bruce meets a black man in a white costume in a warehouse. Morgan Freeman plays God himself, but biblically, you might as well talk about an angel of the Lord. In this sense, 
The angel of the Lord is more than a herald. It's a channel of communication with God. The line is opened. You get to hear what God has to say. And you yourself can say anything to God when you meet an angel. Perhaps the most beautiful biblical example of this is found in the history of Hagar. No, the Viking does not appear in the Bible. Hagar is a slave of Sarah in the book of Genesis. Sarah is the wife of Abram. The couple was left childless, which is a disaster for Sarah, first of all, because in the culture of the time, she is not fulfilling her most important mission in life. But it's also a disaster for Abram because he left everything behind based on God's promise that he would have a great offspring in the promised land. But what if there will be no offspring? In desperation, Sarah suggests that Abraham conceive a child with Hagar. This is entirely acceptable within the customs of the time. A child conceived by the wife's slave is legitimate. This way of thinking, by the way, has recently been repulsively depicted in the series The Handmaid's Tale. When Hagar is indeed expecting a child, tension arises between the two women, so much so that the pregnant slave girl flees from the camp and goes into the desert. The story goes that there she comes to a well and meets an angel of the Lord. The angel asks her, Two questions, perhaps the most important ones of all. Where are you coming from? Where are you going? It is telling that Hagar answers only the first question. She tells about her experience with Sarah. She does not answer the second question. After all, she has no future. He who wanders alone in the desert faces certain death. The angel listens. In the story it's only a line, but I imagine a long conversation, perhaps days, because it's not easy to envision the depth of your existence, put it into words, and entrust it to an interlocutor you don't really even know. That interlocutor, by the way, notes that Hagar has no future prospects, and that is what he has to offer her. Incidentally, not in the way she will have desired. Perhaps she had hoped that he would set her on her way to another camp nearby, another family. But apparently there is none. Go back to your mistress, God says through his angel. That's where your future lies and your son's. Going through so many wonderful movies our culture has to offer, searching for such an angel, I end up with the unsurpassed 1997 Good Will Hunting. Will comes from a troubled childhood and acts like a scoundrel. At the same time, he has an extraordinary mathematical gift that baffles the academic world. Having received a suspended sentence for assault, he must seek treatment with a psychologist. The only one who can handle him is the somewhat downtrodden professor Sean McGuire, played by the sorely missed Robin Williams. He is the angel in this story. He listens. He lets Will talk. Also grants him all the time in the world. He will be the one who opens the future for Will, a new life. In the key scene, the psychologist shows the file he has on his patient and confides that he himself is a victim of the kind of parental violence that hurt Will so deeply. What follows is a dialogue that still touches and moves me. Sean steps up to Will and says, Hey Will, I don't know a lot, but you see this, all this shit? It's not your fault. Yes, I know that, Will replies. But Sean insists, look at me, son, it's not your fault. I know, it's not your fault, I know. No, no, you don't. It's not your fault, I know. It's not your fault, all right. And only now does Sean really get through to Will. It's not your fault. It's not your fault. Finally, Will's defenses fall away and he bursts into tears as he grabs Sean. Oh God, oh God, I'm so sorry, the young man stammers. This is what an encounter with an angel of the Lord looks like, in my opinion. 
Of course, it doesn't necessarily have to be a therapeutic conversation, but it does always have to do with being seen and acknowledged, with the deepest layers of our being, with pain and sorrow, with hope and trust, and with a future becoming possible. In the biblical sense, the angel of the Lord does not need them himself, but to those he meets, he gives wings. Thank you.